much for that introduction, and uh, it's really nice to, to be back at UCL again. Yeah, uh, some more cases I know, so people want to know. Okay, so um, thank you for the introduction, which kind of gave us an initial motivation for studying urban microclimates. That's the fact that we are now more than 50% of the world's population live in cities. So any experience of climate change that most citizens have will be an urban one very much at the scale of individual people, individual buildings, individual streets. But uh, cities being horrendously complicated, it is quite a task to understand what urban microclimate means, it's certainly not commodity. The risks associated with future climate at the scale of cities are kind of clear to us. Um, see the pictures you get on the news, um, which we've avoided this winter, where, where urban areas can exacerbate things like flooding, because they have impervious surfaces. We know that uh, urban areas um, can obviously have a pollution episodes as well, that being a part of the urban atmosphere is what the constituents released into it. Um, and the behaviour of the atmosphere can worsen these pollution episodes or um, uh, mitigate. In overheating episodes, we know that the, the sort of the green lungs of a city like London might dry out. This is not the Sahel, it's actually Hyde Park uh, during 2003. So we know that overheating episodes um, are going to be a feature of future climate, particularly in big mega cities like London. And finally, even though uh, you might not associate cities with being windy, the gusty environments do still cause damage, and because of the density of buildings, then any storms which might pass over urban areas, they're going to cause a lot of damage and lots of insurance claims. So the impacts of the weather on the city are clear, and for cities like London, we now have legislation um, like the Climate Change Risk Assessment, which is done local to this region, where uh, flooding and overheating would be no the risk. But that's thinking of the weather impacting on the city, but what about the um, city impacting on the local weather? Well, I mean, as we dash to mitigate against climate change and adapt to it as well, and try to minimise carbon emissions at the same time, there are all sorts of interventions which are changing our city surfaces. And quite a few of them have a direct impact on the local climates. So buildings don't just withstand climate, but they actually change it. The degree to which they do, i.e. How, how, how effective might it be uh, in cooling the environment, um, is perhaps a little bit of a trial and error. But these, these technologies are with us now to say we stand overheating, and the experiments are starting. So the green wall not only produces the sort of temperature that these people might be experiencing by reducing the surface temperature of the building, um, it can also act to help to reduce the energy use of the building. Um, Boris, of course, got really keen on trees during Olympic year, so greening cities is a really big topic across the planet. But what happens if these trees happen to worsen the local air pollution problem? Because they, they trap the pollution level. So there's definitely uh, co-benefits and disbenefits from some of these design interventions. Moving to a different uh, design that we could choose um, to adapt to climate change to mitigate against it. Natural ventilation of buildings is uh, clearly a, a very energy efficient way of doing it, but uh, does it doesn't actually work. You have to understand about the physical flows of air into and out of the building, which can be highly changed by the surrounding neighborhood. And finally, well, we, we saw in 2006 the, the spikes in electricity use um, in the summer as people started to, to use more energy to do the air conditioning. But this is not get rid, getting rid of heat, it's just moving it somewhere else. So how does the, the impact of uh, cooling systems on one building change the whole neighborhood? So investigation of the urban climate impacts of these design interventions is something which I want to touch on today. And those are technologies that we've all seen and uh, we're all thinking about. But obviously people are starting to think about the future. And future cities, particularly in Asia, are extremely tall. So somewhere like Hong Kong, um, recently, um, relatively recently, they got into their planning guidance that they should enhance city ventilation, not uh, any new design of buildings should not um, exacerbate overheating temperatures. And the sorts of designs they might be thinking about, the architects of uh, Hong Kong, would be something like this. How do you green a skyscraper? What's the best way of doing it? What's the kind of plants that you should use? Where would you get um, the, the water resources to make it work properly? Uh, sticking with um, sort of, um, the influence of nature, the uh, biomimetic principles, 
you might use not only you might not use vegetation, but you might use the way that nature cools itself down. So here's an example where uh, if you take a fractal view of trees, there is a scale relationship between the size of the tree and the size of the individual leaf where the heat is actually being exchanged. So this very tiny surface is very, very good at losing heat. Um, and so a, a designer in Japan has made this, um, this walkway cover, which has actually got the same fractal scale as a tree. Right? These small triangles have the same, the smallest triangle is the size of a leaf, if you like, and the overall size of the, 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 the cover is the size of the, of the tree itself. So understanding heat exchange from building materials and the, the form of the urban environment leads to new designs which are more effective than the ones we have to do. The final example, which um, I'll touch on later, is uh, you may think this is a very nice piece of the uh, Euro design for the nice efficient transport system. This, this isn't a tree, it actually generates wind power. So this is one of the latest designs, which might be you know, less practical and more fanciful. Um, but um, it's another look at how we are generating energy. But all of these designs only work if you really understand the principles and the physics of urban climates. So what I want to do over the talk is, is talk about a series of projects in London that we've been doing in the last decade or so, which have had, um, uh, which have looked at urban climate. And throughout the talk, I'm going to give you one particular Take message, but cover three areas. One is that there are, in order to, to measure cities of today, you need novel field measurements um, and, uh, as Bob mentioned, some wind tunnel modeling to help evaluate and improve microclimate modeling tools. Anybody can, tell, anybody can run a model, but how do you know whether it's right or not? Um, the applications I want to touch on today weather forecasting, uh, micro wind power, as hinted, uh, and building ventilation. Just to give you um, an idea, um, some framework to put the results of the talk in, I just want to just plant one concept in your mind, that there are different scales of the urban atmosphere. So um, if you have a city, um, you have a gentle transition, if you like, from the rural area um, into, into the centre of London. Um, now that, uh, that change of surface has an impact on the local microclimate, because something like concrete and tarmac can heat the local air more than grass and trees. Um, and this um, impact on the air, the local microclimate, extends vertically into the atmosphere. So if you like, there is a sort of bounding box on the influence of the entire city, which we call the boundary there. Come back to that later. Any heat emitted at the surface, any pollution is, is kind of mixed up within this entire box. To give you an idea of scales again, um, so if we start with the scale we are, if we are the physicists, so everything has got one digit so it's uh, uh, about one meter. Um, um, the, we can define a street sort of microclimate, which is 10 to 100 meters, a neighborhood which is up to about a kilometer, like a city block, um, and then the entire city itself. And, and the impact on the atmosphere, as I was saying, extends up to um, increasingly large heights. So if we want to characterize the impact of, say, redesign of a city block, then you have to remember that it's going to be impacting the atmosphere above and it could be impacting the neighborhoods and upstream as well. So with that concept in mind, um, the parts of the talk I want to, to talk about, building ventilation, street heat fluxes, urban river flows, and getting onto the sort of weather scale. Okay, so from the, the series of projects that we've done, um, which if you're interested, you can ask for, for more details. So I just want to highlight results from two for today. One from Actual, um, which was specifically thinking about building design interventions, um, and Refresh, which is focusing on building ventilation. So to start with Actual, Actual has uh, just finished last year and was a consortium, well, a, a collaboration between various uh, sort of universities and, and stakeholders. Um, but just to kind of give you a, a, a sort of pencil portrait of what we did, we set up a, a kind of laboratory in London in that we, we made measurements of uh, the impact of London, as you can see here, on the atmosphere at a range of scales. And we used the BT Tower quite extensively as a sort of reference measurement. And you might think, well, what the heck are you doing up there? Because that's up there and we're in buildings all down here. 
but it's actually a very, very good measurement to use as a reference for, for local measurements. Because uh, each bit of the city is responding to the, the overall city climate. And it's also a good measurement to compare with models, which no model, no weather forecast model can actually can, um, resolve the, the climate or every single street corner. It can do a pretty good job at resolving climate of the beauty tower. So the design of the experiments that we did within Actual were very much sort of thinking vertically, connecting those scales. So we, we made measurements inside um, the Westminster City Council building on Marylebone Road. We've been working with them for about 10 years. Um, we had a rooftop site, which I'm it's, it's been running for around about a decade. Um, and then, of course, the BT Tower, as mentioned earlier. And we made extensive use of the latest kind of measurements um, so not just simple thermometers that I stand on the street corner with, although I have done that in my time. Um, but these are laser-based devices, so I'll be telling you a little bit about that later on, and what you can get from the laser. There's a series of papers, so if you're interested in getting any of the details, so take you through some of the results uh, through the talk. Where were we operating? To give you a sense of scale, we really wanted to, put to, to be measuring in the heart of London, so we get the maximum impact of the urban climate. So being that we had uh, BT Tower at the heart of our design strategy, um, then the, the sites are grouped around BT Tower. And we've also got, got some very interesting bits of London to play around. So there's the rooftop site I was talking about, which I'll show you a little bit. That's about one and a half kilometers away from the BT Tower. So the rest of the talk, I want to use a few questions just to structure some of the of the um, pieces of research that we did, and starting at the smallest scale. So the smallest scale was thinking about um, a building, one of the things we, we, we wanted to know was how do urban winds and temperatures drive the infrastructure of buildings? Buildings are not built in isolation, they have an intensity of streets and other buildings around them. So how does that complicate And this was done uh, by Aiden from his PhD, um, in collaboration with the, the building research. So just to say, uh, describe a bit about what we did as an experiment. It was a bit of a guerrilla experiment in that we had an opportunity to do something. We wanted to just get on with it. And the opportunity was that the building was completely empty. There were no heating systems, there were no people in it. The, the, it was just about to be passed on in ownership. So we could actually look at the physical response to the building. So in a way, it's quite a, 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 not a very typical situation, but it's, it's one that tests the physics in the situation. So there's um, a bit of a, there's a building here, there's a, there's a courtyard here in Marlborough Road, a very polluted street just in front of it. Um, and what we did was to measure, um, <coughs> using a, a BRE um, methodology, measure the concentration of NOx, so nitrogen dioxide, nitrogen, um, um, nitrogen oxide, um, both inside and outside this particular room of study. And with using the pollution as a tracer gas and measuring it constantly over a seven week period, um, we were able to derive um, infiltration rates given some assumptions. Um, again, I don't want to, to, to get too much into the details, but we were using, a, you know, just to show you some of the results over a couple of days, um, we've got infiltration rates and air changes per hour. I don't know if you can, uh, well, you can imagine just the whole volume of this air being exchanged. Um, and here we have a sort of typical infiltration background rate of about 0.1, about 10 hours to change the, the air of the room. Um, this particular day, you can see the crosses and the measurements, and you can see that there are some, there are some dynamic stuff going on. There are times when the infiltration <coughs> rate sort of triples. Um, what's driving that kind of change? Um, the underlying blue line is, is um, uh, an existing model um, of infiltration, which doesn't catch the, the magnitude of the timing of these. And what's causing them? I mean, on this particular couple of days, um, we were measuring the wind speed in the direction um, locally. The wind speed um, is shown in the line. You can see that it does increase, but the infiltration takes a few hours to respond, as you might expect. But what's more uh, notable is that the, the wind direction changes. So these arrows show you where it's coming from. When, when the wind direction changes, you have much, you permit more infiltration. So it's this kind of complexity of the urban flows that we wanted to, to monitor and, and, uh, and measure during this time. 
how to make sense of it and how to reduce it to something usable. Um, this is where we went to the wind tunnel, because even though we can get some really valuable data at full scale, with all the scales of climate acting and the action of the sun acting as well, wind tunnels are pretty useful in terms of building a model of uh, the site and doing things that you can't do in the middle of London, um, of the meteorological kind. So what we did was to simulate uh, different flow directions, different flow speeds, to get patterns around the particular building. Um, so that we could test simple, improved models of the wind that you might input into infiltration models. So, for those of you who are kind of familiar with the techniques of it, um, the, the, um, some of the detail is here. For those of you who aren't, the, the, the result was that, uh, in, in a slide, is that um, using in, in existing infiltration models, like the sort you get in uh, building energy models like Energy Plus, um, we tested those models out against our experimental results, and uh, that's sort of model against experimental results, and there's not, there's not a brilliant correlation. Um, but what we found was that those model predictions could be improved a little bit by a particular choice of in inputs. And we tested about 12 different configurations, going from very simple to most complex, sophisticated models of the winds. Um, I, I don't want to get too deep into that, because um, I, th I think the point is that uh, this is just one particular building. It was um, the, the combination of methodologies to study it, which uh, I think we, we got quite deep into the problem. Sticking with building scale, um, that particular experiment inspired um, some of the refresh project, which um, is just sort of getting started, um, which I want to move on to now. Uh, this is a um, this is, a, this is a collaboration between uh, several universities, the Cory University of Reading and Leeds and South Hampton. Um, and what we're really thinking about is, is the interrelationships between those scales. So we're thinking about the way that people can uh, respond inside the indoor environment, um, how that indoor environment uh, impacts on their ability to perform cognitively, which I won't talk about today. But um, also we're thinking about how that building performs when it's in the midst of a perfect life environment. This, 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 uh, this particular relationship I just want to go into in more detail just now. Um, and this is um, perhaps the first rural urban experiment I've ever done. Okay? So um, we, we, we chickened out doing something like this in the middle of the city like London. Um, but with reason. In fact, we wanted to ask the question, so how is how is a building if you make it idealized, so simple shapes, it's often done in wind tunnels and in uh, numerical simulations, how would the ventilation of this cube uh, building be affected if you surrounded it by other buildings? So archetypes and idealized experiments like this have a long history in the literature, and you can do a good job of sort of uh, deriving model parameterizations from experiments like these. It's very difficult to do it from the real thing. So um, what we did was uh, we gave this building some friends. Um, we built those cubes around it. I should finally say this is the Silso uh, experimental building. So if you're a wind engineer, you know about this cube. It's, it's one of the best studied cubes in the world. Because the other thing you can do is put pressure taps around the cubes. So you can actually look at the forces which are driving the ventilation of the building directly. Just to give you an idea of um, why we're doing what we're doing. Um, PhD student who got a drone for Christmas camera. So anyway, so we wanted to do a little bit of flow visualization. So you can see here's our test cube, here's its friends, here's a dog, um, and almost one of the technicians. But this is just going to be a visualization of the smoke, which is just going to turn on in a minute. Um, and it's going to show you, this is a fairly windy day, but it's just going to show you exactly what the, the nature of the flow is impacting on, on the building within an array of buildings. So we can see that the smoke is wholesale deflected one way and then the other. And you can see the kind of time scales on which those fluctuations are occurring. So the predominant characteristic of urban flows is that it's highly turbulent. But there's some evidence which is emerging is that that turbulence in itself can drive ventilation of buildings, that some a mean flow prediction will, will not give you that. So that was one thing that we really wanted to look at was the turbulence driving the ventilation. And you really have to go to the full scale to look at that problem and get the answer right. So that's why we did the experiment there. Um, 
just to quickly go through. Um, so we used three different, so the, the experiment is still ongoing, and Hannah is uh, trucking up to Silsa every so often to download the data. So this is uh, quite fresh results. We've got three different ways of measuring the ventilation. One is using um, uh, using a direct measure of the, 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 the flow through the openings. The second is the pressure tappings, you know, the pressure measurements I was talking about. The third one is to fill the cube with CO2, just like I'm giving out just now, I'm filling up this room with CO2. But if you open up the cube, it will decay over time. So here's an example of a measurement of CO2 and uh, the time over which it decays. It forms quite a nice exponential curve fit to and then derive what the ventilation rate is. So just to give you an idea, this is a, an example where it's around six and a half air changes per hour. And that, uh, that was a sensor sort of in the middle of the room. But how that, that get that okay that's the methodology, but how does the ventilation rate change when you've got these great big turbulent eddies? driving winds coming out the cube and, and, and when the pattern changes because the wind direction changes, is that going to have a, an impact? So it's a wee bit busy but um, what we were interested in was seeing the variation of ventilation rate with wind velocity, so the speed of wind and the direction. And um, these little um, triangles here are telling you the ventilation rates and just to give you a the headline of that is that you've got a, a, a variation of about a factor of two, where ostensibly the conditions were reasonably constant with a, a nice wind on coming onto the place of the building. But um, what explains these, these differences of a factor of two? A, well, in this particular part where there is a sharp increase in the ventilation rate, there's a decrease in the wind speed. So it's not the wind that's driving it, but there is a shift in the wind direction. Now, some of this stuff is hideously subtle. There's going to be combinations of buildings which drive jets, which drive ventilation. And what we're doing here is not, we're not trying to say that we're going to explain every single wiggle in the data, but we want to get some of the trends so that we can sort of explain more generally what, what's going to drive the ventilation mode. Um, to bring it into arguably the 20th century, I don't know, um, we, we've got some CFD simulations going on at Leeds. Um, who are the ventilation experts. Um, and Marco, Marco Felipe, has been testing open foam. Um, the reason he's using a complex code like this is so that he can do fluctuating simulations. He can start to capture some of the turbulence effects that we're seeing at full scale. Um, he's previously um, been using this code to look at hospital ventilation. Um, this is just one of these boring things you have to do with numerical codes. You have to compare it against good experiments, I might say, uh, to, to see whether it's, it's, it's doing all right. So, so what is, this is just showing um, how the code is simulating the pressure coefficients of the cube. So just to say that when the, when the, when the flow is head on to the cube, you get a positive pressure, you're driving the flow in, and you tend to get negative pressure at the back, so you're sucking the air in from the back. And the, the numerical um, sort of simulations are doing reasonably well. But getting on to what we want to use it for, um, he's starting to simulate the kind of flow patterns you get around these sorts of buildings. Um, so you can start to just simply model what the flow deficit and velocity is. But more interestingly, he's starting to look at the, the ingress into the cube. I should say that there's, a, there's an opening at the front and an opening at the back. That's the case was the results were from before. And comparing the flows when you have head-on um, co uh, compared to, say, oblique wind directions, which cover that, that part where we had a, a doubling of ventilation rate, um, we can see that the, the jets coming into the cube and, and its oscillations, its fluctuations, they're, they're the things that we're starting to pick out as the predominant features. Now, that's, a very, um, that's another very, very highly idealized um, experiment that we're doing because we can only do it um, at that particular site and get enough information to, to get some um, confidence in the, the numerical simulations. But ultimately, we do want to start working uh, somewhere as complex as London, making very good sort of field measurements, making good measurements inside, um, also looking at people's performance. 
but also keeping the, 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 the structure of the measurements I explained before the, the different scales. So I think that one take home message is if, if you look at an individual building, you have to look at what the surrounding microclimate of the neighborhood is. You have to understand what the fluctuations of the weather were at the time. It's all about context. But if anybody's interested in, in being a, a guinea pig in future experiments, let me know. These models. All right, let's shift scales slightly now. Go up to that neighborhood scale I was talking about, where you kind of sort of smear out the individual buildings and you just look at, say, heat exchange between the, the ground and the air above. Now, we've been thinking about this problem for many years at Reading because um, the, uh, the Met Office have said, oh, you know, how do we put this into our weather forecast model? And it's not only them, there's around about 26 models around the world now which are starting to simulate weather forecasts in urban areas. This is because the resolution of the model is getting down to about one and a half kilometers, which is what you see in the tally every night, but they're starting to push it down to 100 meters. Right. So these are models which give us a data set about urban climate like ever before, if we can trust them. So the question in, that we were going to ask initially was, was how does building morphology affect heat fluxes? To give some general idea of what's happening. And this is a, a, a kind of um, iconic image from urban climates in that if you have a street canyon, you have two rows of buildings at the same height, then if you squeeze them together, then the, the flow around the upstream building starts to interfere with the downstream building. And then you get to uh, the extent like the, the streets around here, where the flow above the streets barely enters in, and anything like heat or pollution released here will become more trapped. So we'd expect that in the complex flow you get in these kind of situations that you would have more flux of heat out to the air above. So the bigger the flux, the bigger the transfer, the lower the temperatures, the cooler it's going to be. But at what um, street width do you get this optimal transfer? So we started in the wind tunnel doing this uh, um, about 10 years ago. We just found out that it was um, around about uh, 1 to 1, was about the best ratio because of the, the flow dynamics. Then the next step was to make a mathematical model, which Ian Harmon did, very simply based on resistances, literally the resistance to heat transfer. How much does it get to take to get the stuff off the wall and into the air and then from the street into the air above? So these kind of models have got some relatively straightforward maths behind them, but um, because they're so simple, you can put them in a, in a weather forecast model. So that's, this is currently being put into the, the UK forecast model. But we wanted to ask a question, um, well, how does roof shape change? I mean, there's, there's a thousand papers on square flat roof buildings, there's not many out there. So we need to start adding in complexities to it. So one of the things we wanted to ask was if you change roof shapes, which is not an um, unreasonable sort of retrofit scenario, what's going to happen to the heat transfer? This slightly complex diagram, let me talk you through it. This, this tells you the, the height to width of the streets. So one to one uh, here. This transfer coefficient is just saying how quickly is heat getting out. So that previous result, I told you that there's a peak round about one to one if you have a flat roof. That's completely changed. If you start to put a, a high pitch roof on just to make it really extreme, then you get the black line here. You get um, transfer, which is about 40% lower per certain widths. And there's an interaction between the shape of the roof and the width of the street, so you want to look at both things combined. Now this was of interest to um, project partners um, Arab. We did a bit of flow visualization to understand the third dynamics, but then again, what Wagner did for his PhD was just to use this very, very simple network um, and modify it slightly to take into account the shape of the roof and uh, there were some other um, slight uh, mathematical changes that he's made to this. But this sort of simple mathematical model is one that Aaron are integrating with their indoor uh, room model, if you come across that, to start to predict neighborhood temperatures. And if we go into the future, outdoor thermal conflicts will just start to come as important as indoor thermal. It's a modeling systems like this that, that can help to predict that. Um, just to say, Barbara did a, he's done a ton of wind tunnel modeling as well. Um, and uh, uh, it, this just shows you, if you, if you just want simple messages, that his model, the straight lines, are roughly going through the data. So this is that uh, all models are wrong, but some useful. Okay. 
the, the model is usefully predicting the reduction in transfer due to, to the roof shape change, which I think is a good first step um, for improving models to take into account that kind of ecology. And the final piece of this particular puzzle of mine work is that, um, of course, vegetation, I showed you birds and these trees uh, and the sort of green walls. Um, I mean, we, if we want to have a simple model that can simulate those kind of design interventions, um, this resistance framework is kind of amenable to that sort of extension as well. So Jewick, who's just starting a PhD uh, with the Met Office, is, is, is considering how, in, you know, if you, if you put vegetation in various configurations within the system, What's it going to do to the temperature um, within the street, but also in the air above? So you can get the coupling between the street level and the city scale climate. That's the important point for many of these kind of pieces of work. So that's sort of very much staying at the sort of neighbourhood scale. Let's zoom out a little bit further and get onto the largest scale. Now, like I say, I couldn't sort of stand stand on the street corner with a thermometer for four years and get a piece of climatology. And it would be a climatology of that particular street corner it would be very representative. So um, this is an example of the kind of latest technology which is giving, giving us information about the, the entire depth of that boundary there <coughs> over London. And one of the important things about, say, the depth of that boundary there is that is a proxy for how much heat is given up from the whole city. So we can start to use things we can measure well to test more like for things that would be tricky to measure. So anyway, how does it, how does it work? Well, I'll show you the results um, that we get from it in a moment. But the way it works is that what we get from this is a wind speed measure. The way it works is that there is a laser which uh, we can point in any direction. Um, now, just as this laser is reflecting back from something, this particular laser is on a frequency where it, it reflects back from particles in the atmosphere. So, um, given that urban areas are full of pollution, this is quite a good thing. So, it's pollution particles are about one micron that uh, we need to get a good signal back from the atmosphere. And okay, so we get we get light reflecting back down to the sensor, and we can measure that back scattered light. The clever thing about our uh, particular instrument is that it's Dopplerized. So we send a certain frequency of light out. If the particles are moving away from the sensor, then there will be a shift in frequency coming back. If they're coming towards the sensor, then we'll get um, an increase in frequency. So it's just like an, an ambulance going past, right? So the, the mean on will change the pitch. It's coming and going. So we can make a very good direct wind speed velocity measurement. And I mentioned wind engineering at the beginning. Wind speed data in urban areas is very, very hard to come by. So one of the motivations for using this instrument was to build up a climatology of winds for London. But we did a few other things as well. Again, a bit of a gorilla experiment. We did it because we could. Um, but we were also curious about how uh, an urban river might modify ventilation in the city. So in certain cities like you know, Tokyo, for example, they, they are starting to design a city and take advantage of ventilating flows that are there naturally. So sea breezes, they kind of roll in in the afternoon and cool down the city. But if you block the, the path of sea breezes, then you cut off um, a cool ventilating flow of the city. So Tokyo is specifically using, keeping free these large pathways from the city, like canals and motorways, so that they let the air flow through. But, I mean, what, how big is the effect? So we, we, we put the uh, laser on the roof of uh, Superman's office, who was at KCL, so that's the strand there, and we were shooting across the Thames. And if you shoot in two different directions, which are close to each other, you get two components of the wind vector. So you can work out the horizontal wind. And you can do it at different so-called gates across the LIDAR. So, so at different distances from the sensor, you can resolve the wind vector. So it's a great instrument for not invading um, the space. And what we found, just to, just to sum it up, is that um, on a sunny day, the wind actually increases at the center of the, uh, the, the Thames by a factor of um, yeah, about four or six percent. So we have, again, a natural ventilation of the city due to the fact it's heating up. 
Um, and we looked at the difference between the middle of the river and the, and the side, just to give us an idea of the magnitude of the kind of enhancement of flow you get in the river. Uh, and in the midday, on a relatively sunny day, it looks about one and a half meter per second difference. So the, this kind of information, which you can't get in any other way, uh, gives you an idea of, of the kind of ventilating flows you can get along the rivers. Um, we did want to check whether we trusted it, because uh, I'm a skeptical physicist. Um, so we compared the LIDAR, uh, we pointed it upwards now, and we were sort of measuring three different components of the wind, including the up and down drafts, and we compared it directly with the BT tower. Now that's a slightly technical thing, we got reasonably good results, we were happy with the kind of uh, results it was giving. But that gave us confidence to move on to the more interesting stuff, which is testing out commonly used wind engineering models. So, um, if you were to design a tall building in the centre of London, you might want to know what the stress is going to be in somewhere like a shard, whether you can open and close the windows, uh, whether you can put a balcony in and people can come that, that kind of stuff. But what do you base it on? So there is um, an AirStew model. Um, Harrison Deves is another label for it, which tells you how, what the wind profile is once the wind has crossed London. Right? So once the wind is adjusted to all the suburbs and all the rest of it. So, so this map, um, not to get too technical, gives you an idea of how rough London is. So blue means not very much roughness, it's not too much friction. Um, and then in the centre of London there's a lot of friction because there's a lot of tall buildings. Um, they're quite massive. So we looked at the, the impact on the wind as it transfers from haha throw, surprise, surprise, to the centre of London. And we wanted to, to use a slightly more sophisticated map of the roughness than is uh, assumed by wind engineers at the moment. So um, if you're non-technical, the red line is what wind engineers would assume based on land use, and the black line is a more sophisticated database that we used. <coughs> but what difference does it make to the estimated wind profile? Um, this is, a, this is a, a, a graph of the wind speed, I think it's 30 meters per second, as a function of height. And now what you're looking at is the red is what we've measured with our LIDAR. So the story of it is that we just we measured for about uh, three years. We took out only the highest, the highest wind speed events, which is what we've worried about when you design a building. Is it actually going to withstand the forces? And, and that is the red line now. That's what we found. Black line with the circles is our using the existing model, but with the more sophisticated representation of London. And you can see it looks pretty good. I'll turn to about 250 meters. This is the line. This is what people are doing already, just using the very simple guidelines. So it's on the conservative side. I mean, it's an over prediction of the wind speeds that this this building has to to withstand. Um, but with optimization of building materials, you might want to do better. Than um, and its relevance is that the buildings are getting taller and taller. So that is the shard. So um, just briefly, to, to, to stay at a larger scale, um, we are thinking very hard about how the urban winds across the city, which transfer away heat as much as anything, how do they actually interact with what's happening at the surface, the so-called urban heat and this is a model simulation um, using the Met Office model, but it's been used within the Lucid project, which involves Mike Davis from UCL and, uh, and other folks. Um, and Sylvia Bonas um, did these simulations. You can imagine that London is underneath that. That's a build fraction control. So that is London. Um, and this is sort of temperature at roughly sort of person height. So um, it goes through cycles throughout the day. It's very dynamic, interacting with the weather. Um, and the urban heat time tends to pop out later in the day, so it's about 5 o'clock in the evening, and you start to see London coming out in the great big red wall, and the weather temperature will find out. Um, zooming out a bit, this is a simulation using the same model of a particularly cloud uh, stain, which is a nice case study, because clouds are a bit pesky in the world forecast models, where we had an urban heat time in London uh, being simulated. Um, and this is what the, the, the LIDAR sees, just to, again, just to, just to 
give you an idea. Remember that, that sort of map of the boundary there that I showed you at the beginning, the different layers of the atmosphere being impacted on by the, the ground. This is, the, this is a picture of the epidendros and driven by the hot surface of the city. And it gives us a, a direct measure of how high they get, i.e. what the, the envelope is for the city. Um, and this is one of the things we wanted to see whether the, the, the model would get right. But we also wanted to see whether the model would get those kind of wind profiles right. So is there a possibility of using model data to help design tall buildings in the future? Um, so we have for the, in the middle of this heat island, this, this hot day, we, we have wind speed profiles here from the LiDAR compared to the model. But the model is, is, is we, I think we can start to trust these models in terms of what they do simulate the city impacts on the, the atmosphere. But then there are certain times where there are extremely sharp jets which the model is, is not quite resolving. So there's still um, there's still some work to be done with these weather forecasts. I models. I think in the interest of time, we'll just skip over the next point. Um, another thing that we, if you recall, when I was talking about the sea breezes ventilating Tokyo, well, I mean, the only way you can really observe that kind of thing is using these kind of models. So again, um, this is one thing we did during um, clear flow project we did, um, where there was a, an air pollution episode just before the Olympics, and we were curious about you know, what was causing the, the pollution episode. And we actually had a sea breeze, if you can see here's the corner of southeast of England, we have a sea breeze coming in from the east. And we wanted to ask whether, whether it was actually cleaning the air or making it more polluted. The answer was it actually made it more polluted. But one point here, I'm just using this as an example to show you what these models can do if you push them to 100 meters. So, so this this is a simulation above London. London is underneath that, and th what you're looking at is the temperature sort of fluctuating above the city, um, and it looks like a kind of soup on a boil. Or and that's exactly what's what's happening. This is the, the hot surface is underneath there, driving all this sort of turbulent convection. And then the sea breeze, you can see, you can see that pushing in from all the coastlines coming in the city. So these kind of simulations are becoming used for urban planning as well. But one thing we're doing is validating this model kind of simulation against measurements like the LIDAR that we've just been, we've just been talking about. So just to say that we, I think we are on the brink of being able to use the weather forecast, which is run and validated every single day, as design data. That, that could be a, an option for the future. Finally, I just want to visit a couple of things uh, that we've been uh, looking at. Uh, do you know what borough that is? So, so anyway, so there were these requirements to, to, for new build to, to start generating renewable energy. And um, I wouldn't say that I'm advocating urban wind power as a solution for our problems, but it's just to highlight that there could be a problem that we've been uh, putting it in the wrong place and using the wrong kind of turbines for the kind of complex urban flows that we are telling about. Uh, it's not just me asking this question, there is actually a, um, a cost action at the moment in the European Corporation um, to, to revisit this idea of urban wind power. Within a, an energy system, it might have been thrown out some time ago, I think you know, there are still you know, questions about this technology and the prediction of the So just to report on a couple of things we've been doing, which has been taking advantage of all these new urban climate tools and models and measurements. Um, so this is work that Dan Drew did for his PhD asking the question how much wind power resource is there in London. Now I think there's worth in calculating these kind of maps, finding out simple ways of calculating wind for other applications like ventilation. But for now we, we, we did it for, for, for wind power. And you can kind of see uh, the, the parks of London coming out. So there's Richmond Park, for example, where you really get quite a wind speed. And what Dan did was to take um, 34 turbines to commercially available turbines for solar axis and horizontal axis, um, and map out the capacity factor of these turbines for a year of, of, of data as a function of distance from the city centre. So you can see there's some pretty lousy capacity factor as well, but this is, this is uh, normalised by the, the rural capacity factor. Um, so we're not saying that this is, this is going to um, uh, 
and you, you're never really going to generate a lot of energy in urban areas. But there are some, the, these, um, the extent of these, uh, this standard deviation that has been applied shows you that there are some sites where it might well be worth it, or worth not throwing out. So the detailed neighborhood scale wind times can be considerable. And especially if you're thinking about these taller buildings which are sticking their heads over the parapet of the other buildings. And with that last thought in mind, what, what if you just think about the tall buildings? Um, this is an example of the kind of different kind of technology that people are still thinking about um, designing, uh, developing. So this, this is an idea of can we design turbines better suited to urban environments? I mean, I'm not saying you should develop them all looking like trees or anything. You know, that's still a lousy wind environment at the street level. But if you start to focus on the tall exposed buildings, then it, it, it can make a contribution. So this is a, a design that um, uh, Rosario Nabile was working on for his HD uh, with um, himself and Maria, Maria Badati Reading. And it's an augmented vertical axis wind turbine. So it's got a, a little, it sort of squeezes the air into the turbine to increase the velocity and reduce the turbulence. Uh, of course, you can see it's a vertical axis, so you can take the fluctuation winds that you tend to get in the urban areas. And uh, this was a design study, so uh, Rosario used uh, transient CFD to, to look at the, what would be the optimal configuration of the turbine. Um, and this is just an example of the kind of, the, sort of a movie of the kind of data that he was generating. So, so looking at um, um, the actual fluctuations and pinching on the turbine, and looking at the best setup of um, the rotor and uh, the sort of stator outside. So, Having got an optimal design, um, in parallel to what I was doing, there was a prototype actually being built of this particular turbine. Um, so it's not just a, a sort of desktop study. And that's actually been in, that's actually been introduced into St George's Tower in the centre of London. So so there are some designs which are out there. If we're going to bother to do them, let's make it the right place and the right kind of design for the flow of the Unfortunately, I cannot tell you how much is generated at the moment. Anyway, so uh, that was a bit of a quick rush through some of the, the projects that we did to give you more information from this aspect. But the you know, key principle is that the urban climate is active on many scales. And you have the best uh, um, chance of generalizing urban climate if you measure it on all scales. New observations are definitely needed to underpin the development of robust models. Um, and then we might start to understand how these new designs of buildings retrofit options we have, and then they impact on the city um, on a larger scale. And I think that the long-term measurements that we're developing in London, I mean, there's a few of us who are, who are doing this, um, keeping the kind of measurements that we've been using in research mode for the longer term, um, it seems that they are starting to aid sustainable city development. It's, um, various moves by the London Climate Change Partnership to support these kind of measurements Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's quite a few birthday presents. Um, no, no, right. 
it's, well, I mean, we, when we bought it, it was about 120,000. Which actually, compared to the, the, the technologies that I've got, I've been sort of messing around in projects with Lidas for at least sort of 12 years or so, the, the technology has become commercially viable. So, for example, after the volcano eruption, you know, when the ash kind of, these things can see ash as well. Um, and um, quite a few of those were, um, those particular instruments were adopted across Europe as a sort of, um, a sort of watch monitoring system for ash kind of. So they are becoming commercially available and robust. They have their difficulties in the, um, the minimum well, the distance. Ash, the rooftops, because we've got a couple of rooftops. Right, yes. So they have to yeah. be on rooftops and then you can go around to it. I don't think that's too much about. So then it's kind of what's the way to go Well, I mean, so for example, this, this particular design is ice safe, the new generation oh. R. So the Civil Aviation Authority is not too modest. Um, um, you can, um, they're, they're much more sophisticated instruments now. So if you do accidentally point them, point them at a brick in front of you, they won't fry in the sense. Uh, there are limitations. I mean, you can get um, the nearest velocity we could get to the sensor was around about 90 meters away. So we weren't thinking about deploying it in a street level. Um, but the new versions, they're improving that, and so we can get, get to see about sort of, uh, 36 meters away. Um, and I'm talking to a group in Hong Kong about taking the LIDAR there because, because those kind of deep canopies, which I mean, all that I've been talking about, the, the, the entire sort of history of urban climate, has been thinking about North American and European cities. And what very little information about what happens in tropical and climate cities, for example. But these kinds of instruments, that benefits them, because the deeper the street canyon, you know, it doesn't matter that we can't see the 12 space to 6 meters of what's happening, because we can see the people and stuff above that. So that's a little bit about the line, at least this technology is changing quite fast, and people have started to see um, the second point about the um, wind engineering models. Um, so there's, yeah, these guys called Deves and Harris developed um, a set of equations which just basically look at the effect of friction on the wind. That's a part of it, that's what it does. Um, in order to estimate well, what would the wind profile be as a function of height over particular surfaces with particular kinds of friction. And you could just solve the equation saying, right, I'm in an infinite city, <laughs> right? Which, when I went to Tokyo, that's what it felt like. I'm in the middle of the city that's expansive in all directions. Then you can make a very simple assumption, and just say, right, is that friction of an urban surface that's curving the wind growth away from the ground? But cities aren't infinite, and they change quite a lot. So you can get what's called a non equilibrium where you allow the wind to profile to adjust to the city as it's crossing the city. And Stephen Harris did the maths behind this. And it became, um, uh, I forget, I'm, I'm forgetting the, the guidance notes that it's in, but it, it's just used for in wind engineering cycles for um, estimating, say, the shaft, if you just want to sit down and estimate what's the wind pressure going to be at the top of the shaft. Exactly. Yeah. And you can see there are different layers in the atmosphere. There's all sorts of funny things at night where you can get extremely high wind speeds. So I hope that gives you a bit of yeah. Yeah. And there's a paper. Do we have any more questions? Yes. Um, with regards to the wind turbine, I found that design very interesting. But I was wondering whether they gave any consideration to migration calls on the building itself. Is that I've heard, I'm, I'm not absolutely sure about this, but I've heard that there have been other projects that have been unsuccessful for that very reason. Yeah, yeah, I mean, completely. I mean, one has to have a skeptical eye of these projects, you know. Um, that particular design of turbine is from a company, um, but it was, it's, it's between an engineer and an architect. So the idea is that you design the building to have the turbine built in rather than retrofitted. Yeah, we can't. 